and joining us now to discuss his future prospects as leader of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sapar Kalala. He is the president of the National People's Patriotic Party of the Congo. And we welcome you here to TVO in uh, a place you're very familiar with, right? When did you come to Canada for the first time? Uh, it was in 1984. 1984? Remember, uh, yes, and uh, in Edmonton, Alberta. We're going to put a map up first to just remind people where the Congo is, the Democratic Republic of Congo, 68 million people, a large country in terms of land mass, uh, slightly smaller than Ontario and Quebec combined, and it has uh, nine countries on its borders. For the past decade, the Congo has been at the center of a war involving its own troops, troops from Rwanda, troops from Uganda, other rebel elements. How would you describe the state of affairs of the country today? Worse. Worse. Chaos. Frustration. The country is uh, below. You can read all the reports from the world. Look at the UNDP or the reports, or development reports. What is the place of Congo? This is the richest country in Africa with the, po with the poorest people. There is no war at all. And uh, people are going to bed hungry. Ch children are not attending schools. Access to health is a, is a lax because you cannot go to, the, the, there are no health care facilities. Employees, civil servants, and all others are not being paid. You can find some even not being paid for four, five, ten months. But is the state of affairs such that there are, is there fighting every day? Are there people being killed in fighting every day? Congo has lost, has lost more, okay, it's still 10 million people, it's still counting. And if we had really a government, why can the government not protect those people? It's, it's despicable. And when I'm talking here, I am a humiliated man. Why? Because when people come to the country, think people coming to Canada and they rape all the women, and you are still standing there as government. Isn't it a shame? As a man, as a son of the cat country, it's not acceptable. Those women cannot be raped on my watch and cannot accept what is happening in Congo. And I am very irritated. I'm very frustrated. I'm feeling very humiliated. And I, I, even when I talk, even I eat, I don't feel like I am human because this is, this is a country which has a government, which has people, which has men, and nothing is happening. And those women are being raped every day. People are being killed every day. I can give you an example. For example, uh, a, a human rights uh, activist went just to visit with a police officer. After presenting the, his report to the police officer, he was coming out and he was shot. And the people are acting with impunity like that. And in Congo, it's what's happening every day. So many people have died. Some just like interviewing them like this, you are interviewing me, and somebody comes in and shoots. Well, let's follow up with this United Nations report on war crimes and crimes against humanity, which was leaked, uh, I guess, um, in August. And this is, um, this is a focus on 1993 to 2003. And here's a quote. They are the hidden horrors of a war the world ignored. The staggering cost, 5.4 million dead, women and girls raped and mutilated, refugees deliberately starved, hunted or beaten to death, entire tribes and villages marked for extermination is laid out in a controversial UN report. A draft copy of the final report obtained by the National Post not only says Rwandan troops carried out hundreds of large-scale killings of ethnic Hutu refugees in the DRC in the late 1990s, which may amount to genocide, it also details a pattern of warfare in which civilians were deliberately targeted by all sides. The UN study describes a six-month, quote, mapping exercise of the most serious violations of human rights and international humanitarian law committed within the territory of the DRC between March 93 and June 03. It lists 617 atrocities it says could rank as war crimes or acts of genocide. How has this report been received in the Congo? This is that amount to the genocide. More than any population of the world after the World War II have been killed in Congo. And this is quite enough. Enough is enough. 
People are dead and they are still dying. United Nations, yes, I remember that our traditional friends, and I'm talking about our traditional friends, I'm talking about the United States of America, uh, Canada, and the European Union, have done too much for Congo. They have given everything to Congo. But that help, Congo has become like a, a money pit. The money is going nowhere. For now, what I say is that uh, I condemn if Rwanda, because Rwandese are not our enemies, that we are brothers and sisters. To see Hutu, Bashi, we have the same tribes in Congo. Those are our citizens, my citizens, because I'll be president of the Congo, and those are my people. But if Rwanda has <coughs> pushed itself to do such kind of the community genocide in, in Congo, it's quite uh, regrettable, and I believe that Rwanda has the obligation to start the investigation right now okay. to find out what's happened. Tell me how much of this you place at the feet of President Kabila. It is under his watch. He's doing nothing. He is reduced to the mayor of Kinshasa. Do you think he could stop this, though, if he wanted to? He would have. He should. He, he has to. Because this I is... I understand, but if you say he's just the mayor of Kinshasa, perhaps there's not that much he can do. I want to know if you think he can do more. He should have done more. He could have done a lot. He has to do a lot. And if he's standing there and watching people, mostly women of Congo, being raped, and he's there, he's reading all of those things. Why is he not reacting? I would like to ask the government of Kinshasa and the President Kabila just to resign and to let us rule, rule, rule the country because it's a service. It's not a job. Being in power, being a, it's a service. We would like to put Congo in the concept of nation. We would like Congo to be like Canada, like United States, like the European Union. We would like to be in a civilized world where people, things are transparent, where people are accountable, where people can at least have hope. We are well, the party of hope. Let and me follow up on stuff. that. You say we are the party of hope. You, you, um, you created a new political party over there. How, why did you do that? I, because of the misery of my people, misery of Congolese people, and they're reading always bad news. There's nothing better coming from, look, for example, Steve, look at what people are reading. The report is there. Have you ever heard any good news coming from Congo? For a long time, there is nothing done. We, Congo has gone to the extent of even of selling the mineral rights. I'm not against China, but we have to do business the right way with corporations. With our, you are selling mineral rights of your, of your country. And what, what are all of those young people going to do? The students are going to do. What are other people are going to do? It's not acceptable. The Congo is ruled by people I call like, a, they're like, a, Apprentice sources, they react mm. to, to, to okay, each event. I understand. Tell me, you've had one election in Congo, right? One presidential election? Yes. A few years ago, 2006, was it? Yes. Okay, you've got another one coming up November of 2011. Yes. Uh, has, in your opinion, has democracy taken root in Congo enough for those elections to happen in a free and open and transparent way? I am giving you an example. If the world has supported us, it's because they saw that if democracy comes to Congo, things will work. I thank a lot the United, United, United States of America, Canada, and the whole Western world, including the European Union, for at least helping us to put us in the right of democracy. But I would like those countries to send enough monitors to protect this moral, moral democracy they put there. Because since democracy came, the one who, who became president through democracy is now acting like a, a little dictator down there. So you're going to offer yourself as a presidential candidate next time, is that right? For sure, yes. And I'm going to be the next president of Congo. You think you will be the next president? For sure. Um, it goes back to my previous question. Do you think democracy has taken root enough so that you will be able to campaign openly, that you will get access to television and advertising of other types? Is that there going is, to happen? There is no access. Opposition has no money. Well, that's what I'm saying. The oppositions are being, uh, opposition leaders are being beaten up, are being uh, uh, ostracized. They are being, uh, Congo is a problem, a very big problem. People are dying every day. So how can you succeed? If the, if, the, if the deck is stacked against you, how can you succeed? We have people, we have our resolve, and we are determined. Are you concerned for your own safety as you campaign? Very concerned, very concerned, because is a place where you can try to, to, to hope to do things, but others are not thinking that way. It's not like opposition like in Canada or in the, in the US where people are acting. It's not a dissent. It's now, because like now I'm here, I'm not against 
It's not personal. I'm not against the President Kabila. Personally. Have you ever met him? I saw him when he was a kid and I, I met with his father, but not him. And uh, he was just a, a kid of our president. And uh, I had a lot of respect, but I believe that even now he's the president of, our, of Congo. Mm -hmm. I respect that. I am not against him. I can protect him anytime, but I don't want him to be any more president. It's finished. Do you, in this country, in many countries, uh, when it's time for an election, the leaders have debates. Do you anticipate that you'll be able to get up on a platform somewhere and have a televised debate with him? I believe so. I believe that he, he will come and we shall debate and to see how he's, uh, he's, he's driving our, where he's driving our country. You really think that'll happen? A televised uh, debate? Uh, uh, it has never happened, but I think this time he's, he has to be at least forced to do it because he knows that uh, he's not going to be president. If there is transparent, and, uh, fair and free elections, he's gone. And I would like me to with Congolese people together to give Congolese people that hope. The hope is what? The Congolese people have to have the jobs. Women cannot be raped anymore. That's priority. Man. Women of Congo who are raped, I'm coming. It's finished. It's, it's over. Those people, with, as a lawyer, I don't expect to have weapons to be shooting at people. I would like to see those who have committed the crimes against humanity, against our women, to go through the justice. That's the civilized way to do things. I would like to see business to be free. We have to invest. We have to have our traditional friends in, in place. Then when I'm talking about um, our traditional friends, they know where they are. I talk about the West mostly, the US, Canada, eh, and the eh, European Union. And I would like things to be working the right way, free markets, civilized way. And I would like to put Congo in the concept of civilized nations. That's what I would like to do. And what also I want to do, I would like one day in my term under my watch to change the country, to put the power into the hands of people to create, to have a parliament and the prime minister who can rule the country, the president will be just ceremonial. And that way, the president won't have that power to take the parliament and other uh, institutions uh, in, in hostage. That's what I want to do. I would like Congo to change. People have to have hope. I would like my people to have hope. And that hope, that's what I represent them. National People's Patriotic Party of Congo, as they call it, Nouveau Parti Patriotique du Peuple Congolais, is there to eradicate the poverty, eradicate corruption, try to put people on the pedestal, men, women, but our women who are being raped every day, that is, that is very sad. And 10 million dead, and even the government is not talking about that. This is a genocide here. We are talking about the genocide in Congo. And we are still talking. What do we have to talk? Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Government of Congo and all the institutions of Congo, like a parliament, they have to be. They have to resign. That is it. And let us rule, rule our country. Make it well. well your election work. is uh, just a little over a year away. So we shall keep an eye on this story. And if you come back to Canada, I hope you'll come visit us again here at TVO. Thank you, Mr. Kalala. Thanks a lot. Thanks.